Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And uh, welcome, Ro welcome to the Roxbury branch of Boston Public Library. And th there you are. And I'd like to introduce you, please, to the head librarian, who is such a cool guy. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And again, I want to welcome you to the Roxbury branch of the Boston Public Library. <coughs> Dr. Sonia White approached me about having this program here with the public education church here. I said, that would be great. I'm glad that you're coming here. She, she went out of her way to ex express her uh, gratitude for the great panel that effectively you're going to share with us, though. So I'm sure we will not be disappointed. We will go away with uh, tremendous amount of knowledge, though. And I am happy myself to be able to sit in and participate. And, Again, welcome and thank you for coming to the Roxbury Branch. And don't make it the last time either. <laughs> and just a, a little plug for the library and of course for the work that we do. Right back here we have some books that you might be inspired after hearing some of our conversation. Um, there, we have resources right here that in fact I'm returning today so if you really are interested in some of them you can either take those with you today. Alrighty, let's start properly. Um, of course, welcome. But before we immerse ourselves in our important work, our adventures and discoveries, it's important for me to acknowledge the peoples on whose land we stand and those who brought us here today. So to that end, I acknowledge the Massachusetts, the Wampanoag, and the Nipmuc peoples and all the ancestors of this region. I acknowledge my ancestors, uh, bloodline and musically speaking, um, who've gone before me, names known and not known, who blazed trails, and the privilege that I have of continuing and expanding. And last but not least, I'd like to acknowledge the ancestors of all of you who are here today and encourage you to learn as much about your own personal story as you can. Uh, and call on the strengths and shatter the limitations of your ancestors. All right, so our name Sankofa Psalms refers to an Akan proverb. Some of you might be wondering, what's a Sankofa, right? Uh, the Akan are people who live in current day Ghana in West Africa. And Sankofa translates loosely to go back and fetch it or it is not wrong to go back and take what is yours. Today we will explore gifts Boston's iconic Afrocentric music educators have left for us. And a quick word about this term Afrocentric. At Sankofa Songs, we use this term to connect our work with a specific place on Earth, Africa, and to the many scholars, statesmen, and others ex uh, examining Pan-Africanism through the last 300, 300, 50, 400 years, and to the millions of African descended peoples all around the world and on the African continent. So let's get down to business. <laughs> Our goal today is to introduce you to African descended peoples' approach to music education, the Afrocentric arts education framework, and to show this mindset in historical context. We'll discuss these pedagogues for beliefs, overarching goals, engagement with communal learning and their practice. When engaging in African element, person, instrument, composition, etc., etc., Afrocentric music educators always keep that element at the center of their teaching. Likewise, their teaching maintains a dedication to cultural emancipation. Dr. Cecil Adderley is chair of Berkeley's music education department and president of the National Association for music educators. Okay, President-elect. Uh, he's got over 38 years of teaching experience at the junior, senior, high school, and college levels. He has performed professionally as a clarinetist and violinist, served as a U.S. congressional intern on Capitol Hill, chair of the Northboro School Committee, member of the Northboro uh, Cultural Council and New Jersey Music Educators Association uh, as higher education representative and past president to the Mass Music Educators Association. Dr. Adley has published in numerous journals and has presented his findings globally. He served
serves a profession in relation to equity as well as advocating to improve education for all. And that's just the first person. <laughs> Mariana Greenhill has been a multi-prize winner at the Sphinx competition and a recipient uh, in 2009 of the Sanford Allen Award. And by the way, if you're not familiar with some of these awards and organizations, please look them up. We will not be grumpy if you pull out your phone and Google away, because there's going to be stuff to Google. Uh, all right. She has served as concertmaster of the Soul Symphony, embodying her commitment to Afrocentric music performance. Uh, highlights from that collaboration included performances performances of Darren Atwater's in the award-winning song In a Strange Land. And let's see, she's committed to a variety of musical styles and has collaborated with gospel artists, Donnie Clerkin, Richard Smallwood, The Gorillas, uh, Jess Stone, and Alicia Keys. Um, so quite quite a few different um, broad range of, of artists. She's an alumna of Project STEP. We'll talk a little bit more about STEP as we go along. If you're not familiar, you'll find out. Ms. Greenhill attended Walnut Hill School for the Arts, the Juilliard School, the Man and Manus College, and she's founder of Four Strings Academy and currently oversees the spring program at Boston Arts Academy. Ashley Gordon is driven by an unwavering sense to foster cultural curiosity. She uses every stage in classroom as an educational opportunity to flood our collective consciousness with examples of black creativity and excellence. Her largest vehicle for promoting this is Cast of Our Skins, a Boston-based concert and educational series dedicated to celebrating black artistry. Ms. Gordon has co-founded a uh, Castle of Our Skins and Castle, and currently serves as its artistic director. She has presented lectures on citizen artist, artistry and entrepreneurship, workshops on Caribbean folk songs, served as a panelist at national conferences, discussing topics of diversity in classical music, and is an instructor of teaching artistry at the Laundry School of Music at Bard College. Alyssa Jones, who is right here on our screen, and this is Florida. Well, she's on our screen is a nationally recognized DEIA facilitator. Her work in the Boston Public Schools at Boston Art at Boston Arts Academy and as District Program Director for Performing Arts aimed to center diasporic music with skills-based curriculum. In response to this and the needs of black composers of concert music, Ms. Jones found the Rising Tide Music Press, a nonprofit publishing program for emerging black, brown, indigenous, and Asian composers. Currently, Ms. Jones serves as director of vocal ensembles at University of South Florida, where she extends this work through ensemble programming and free service training. Brian Kellum believes greatly, uh, Dr. Kellum believes greatly in Afrocentricity in action, the concept of putting Afrocentric values into practice as lived experiences. Dr. Kellum's work embodies this philosophy through musical projects aimed at empowering African-American youth, including leading the Cameron Youth Chamber Orchestra. Recent research activities uh, led Dr. Kellum to document Venezuelan children's performances in traditional orchestral settings and these students' musical activities rooted in African drumming and dance traditions that are native to the Afro-Venezuelan region of that Barlo place. Who did you say that? Barlo Vento. Barlo Vento. Uh, when not busy teaching music or conducting research, Dr. Callum can be found on a tennis court perfecting his Serena's William serve. Driven by an unyielding belief in music's power for social change, Dr. Ian Saunders, Hello. Hi. Will you sit right here? Thank you. Uh, let's see. Dr. Ian Saunders is dedicated to refining, uh, redefining, sorry, the contemporary relevance of classical music, De uh, demonstrating his commitment to artistic endeavors, educational contributions, and visionary leadership. He currently serves. 
is our artistic director, Bruce Smith, an institution devoted to delivering ex extensive musical education to classical music, in classical music, I'm sorry, to artists from underrepresented communities. Dr. Saunders and Project Step aim to elevate and nurture these voices through community cultivation, cultural celebration, and artistic partnerships. After over 30 years as a performer, bassoonist, 15 years as a music professor, and over 15 years as an arts administrator, Macaulay in Washington has established himself as a leader for the next advocates and entrepreneurs. He is nationally sought after. He is. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you laughing at Nicole? Like Tell him I was supposed to wave. I didn't know I was supposed to wave. I was just like, I was reading the lungs if I didn't know what it said. <laughs> 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 He's a nationally sought after thought leader and consultant and he's been a staunch believer in the relevance of music as a field for social change. Mr. Washington currently serves as a Director of the Community Music Center of Boston and serving over 2,500 students each week. The vision of this fabulous institution, the Community Music Center of Boston, under Mr. Washington's leadership, is to develop shareable and scalable frameworks for engaging in learner centered and culturally inclusive music teaching and learning. He served on the faculty of the Oh, I did say it. Okay. Stellenbosch International Chamber Music Festival in South Africa for quite a while, right, from 06 to 13, and his album Legacy, check it out folks, Legacy, Music for Bassoon by African American Composers was released in 2008. And then there's somebody else. <laughs> All right. specific to teach on such universal truths like love and fellowship and kindness for community sort of blew my mind. I hadn't necessarily seen that before. Um, and it got me on many rabbit holes, the Smithsonian folkways, to, to hear and learn more about her and then others um, like her who use something culturally specific to teach um, in, in culturally specific ways about such universal truths. I would say um, there's a man, his name is Dr. Ronald Crutcher. Uh, you know Ron? Everybody knows Ron. Um, when I met Ron Crutcher, it was uh, 1994. I was a college freshman at the <coughs> University of Texas, and Ron Crutcher was the director of the School of Music at the University of Texas when I got there. I think he started the same year. Um, and so I'm, you know, just graduated from high school. I grew up in, born and raised in Texas, and I go into the School of Music, and the person who is in charge of the, you know, the futures of all these people, all these faculty, is a black man. 
and I had never seen uh, anything like that in my life. Uh, I, it was something I just had never experienced. Um, and he was authentically black and authentically who he was. He walked in Ron Crutcher like every day. And I was like, I don't know if we're supposed to do that. Like, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't know that was a thing that we could do. Um, and, but just watching him just maneuver that role. And he was there, I think, my entire time. I think my first year was his first year. My last year was his last year. I think he went off to be the provost of the University of Miami, Ohio, or something like that. Um, but I, not only did I get to watch him do the job, but uh, Ron Crutch was also a cellist. Um, and I also got to watch him perform. So I watched this person who was a very gifted, very talented musician who was also running one of the largest music schools in the country and who also happened to be an authentically black man. And so for me, as I have thought about my own, uh, my own role, it is uh, very much in trying to create places and spaces where people can find their own brilliance through authentically being themselves. Uh, and so not trying to find your brilliance by trying to mimic the behaviors of someone else, some other culture, um, but actually being able to allow your actual brilliance to shine via your authentic self, whether it's artistically, administratively, or academically. Uh, so that is, that's kind of, um, but Ron was the first person who I got to really, I'd seen people do it, like people keeping it real, but they were broke. I had never seen somebody who kept it real and like actually had like this like beautiful life attached to that. Um, I hadn't seen that before. And so uh, I would say that Ron Crutcher for sure, and every marker along my career, Ron Crutcher has been there. If I call him up, every time I send out a back signal, he always responds. Um, and so he's someone who has been a part of my life uh, since 1994. Um, in the moments in which I need him, oftentimes it had to do with me trying to navigate from, uh, various places, lack of cultural competency uh, and cultural fluency, and Ron has always been there uh, for that, uh, and for me, uh, his, you know, throughout my entire career. So he was the first person that popped into my mind. It wasn't someone who like taught me how to play the bassoon, or was a professor in a class, or a teacher that I had. This was just someone who was a mentor to me. I have many stories about Ron Crutcher supporting my career. Uh, my first bassoon was bought by um, a philanthropist that Ron Crutcher knew. That he, that he connected this person to me and they bought me my first bassoon. That was the bassoon that I used to win competitions and my jo every job I won, I won on that bassoon that was connected to Ron Crutcher. Uh, so he, he's had this huge um, impact on my life in various ways, uh, not only being who he was, but also in you know, allowing some of that shine to uh, warm, my, warm my path as well. Uh, the person that pops into my mind is my cousin, Veronica Tyler, um, who was an amazing um, soprano. Uh, and um, she's, like, you can look her up. She's on YouTube. She's amazing. Um, she's on, uh, she performs with Bernstein and um, many other uh, conductors. Um, but from a, from a young child, I didn't really understand everything that was happening um, because it was my family. Like, my, my entire family is educators. And I was like, that's not what I wanted at all. <laughs> like, I, if you had asked me 20 years ago if I was going to be an educator, I would be like, yeah, no. Um, <laughs> I'm all stuck with that. Um, but. I, uh, all of them are either teachers or, uh, and are still teachers um, or musicians of some capacity, it's either musicians in the church or um, my cousin who stepped out and um, was a professional opera singer. Um, and she took me along uh, with her to uh, several different artistic engagements and I remember um, her launching her production of What to Be, What to Do. Um, and she was the first person that I knew who was authentically herself, like all the time, unapologetically herself, all the time. Told me stories, I have so many stories. Um, I guess that's the part of the Yoruba in me that I really love and appreciate because I remember all of the stories that she told me. Um, and, uh, 
the richness of the history and the things that she taught me, um, I will never forget, and I try to do that as well um, when I'm teaching. So I'm, yeah, I'm trying not to get emotional, but yes, like, and she passed away a couple of years ago. So um, I remember and want to promote her legacy. The first person that kind of helped us with arts education was my mother. She was a home economics teacher and later a uh, social worker. But when we were kindergarten, early grade school, the family piano was in there and we were tinkering around with the child. So she starts uh, teaching my brother and I until she realizes that uh, she's probably going to need some help with two young boys to <laughs> handle our curiosity. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, we have to be, when things are being filmed, <laughs> no, uh, yeah. um, but there are a group of teachers that, in that community I grew up, because I grew up in Columbia, South Carolina, and um, around the corner um, was our neighborhood piano teacher, Virginia Cofield, who was also the organist of one of the local Amy churches in town. <clears throat> so the experiences that she pulled from in looking at the, the people that were in our community, the neighboring communities, was how do you get, keep their interest uh, as you're educating them? You know, there are things that you want to uh, teach them as part of the canon, but, <clears throat> excuse me, but you're also bringing in things from the black church, you're bringing in things from the community that will make what they're learning relevant. And then weaving in um, <clears throat> theory, I don't know why my voice is threatened, but there's an allergy in the kitchen this morning. And um, actually looking at uh, how do you, you keep the interest of all these kids in, the, in the, that community. Because when I look back on those times, it seems like she must have taught every kid in that neighborhood piano. Um, which today I don't see that as much in certain communities where you know every kid is tied to this one teacher. Um, and I stayed with her until she realized that at, at a particular you know, point in my development it was time for me to move over to the university to study. Um, later on, I would say the other person that uh, made a huge impact was my high school uh, and middle school uh, band director. Alan, the late Al McClain trumpeter, and Willie Lyles, trombone and keyboardist, who looked at more along the lines of what was happening in jazz and R&B, a number of the musicians that were coming through the uh, Carolinas and parts of Georgia would stop in because they got obviously played them in. So having that uh, early experience and the door being open to look at what was culturally relevant to the students in that particular population at the time and watching the demographics of the school change, uh, which they did. <laughs> this was during the time of you know, right post-integration, but also white flight happening within the, the district, um, that the teacher was really trying to, to let us know that what you bring to the table is important, but also having other role models outside of arts education quite helpful because of the time, and this is a story I, I told you too earlier, that in my elementary school, going back to my first experience with string education, uh, Becky Williams, whose husband was at the university, was giving a project, I think as most trailing spouses are, um, to start a string program. And you know, they put her in the heart of the black community, I think really to, to keep her quiet. <laughs> but not thinking that it was going to be a success. Um, but what she brought to that table, and being open-minded and not from that community, uh, put us in a position to succeed. And I think about all the great string players who went on, came out of the program. Because most people from South Carolina always knew the spark for orchestra. That was you know, kind of the, the gym in that state. But you see her teaching Columbia, what she was able to produce, uh, said a lot about her.
She lived in the community. The church was in the community. You know, Becky lived outside of the community um, and came into the community. Willie Lyles lived in the community. Um, Al McLean lived in the community. And some other people lived in those, those communities where I was actually teaching them. Where today, because of transportation and how housing is set up, most of us commute and live in different communities. It's not from the times where my parents were educated. Um, you know, we grew up in that community and you saw the same people in that community. Um, you went to the grocery store and you saw your third grade teacher. You saw the, the, grocery, the person at the grocery store, you saw the person who um, was at your church, you saw the people who were at your barbershop, who were at your dentist, and so on and so forth, and these people become the role models for you. Okay? Prime example. Pop in my head you're talking about community. There's a movie out right now, uh, American Fiction. I don't know how many people have seen it. Okay. American Fiction is based on the book Erasure by Percival Everett. So when I saw that pop up, I went back and I read, not only have I read the book, but Percival Everett Sr. was my dentist. So you think about knowing these people as a child, they get wow. You know, this is a role, was a role model because he was part of that community. He was in high school, his first senior was in high school with my mother. Or I think about the role models of, you know, you're thinking about going out into space, and I've always been a science fiction fan. I know there are people who love Star Trek, people like me who like Lost in Space and some of these other ones, but it's Star Wars. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the Boldens, the Charles Bolden, the Boldens were church, you know, and uh, Charles was another church with his uncle, but having those types of role models as a child saying that science isn't that far off for us, that there are people that look like us, and that uh, we can be in space, we can be a part of the future, and you're seeing that kind of change in science fiction. So I think sometimes having those role models in your community, or where you can actually touch and feel these people, to know that they're real, uh, makes an impact on you, or it did make an impact on me, to know that will life necessarily be easy? No. But uh, if they can do it, then I too know I can do it. Brian, Ian, I'm happy. Alyssa? I'm happy too. Uh, so, um, okay. My mentor's name was Kem Williams, Kem A. Williams. I grew up in St. Louis, and I had the sad but uh, fortunate opportunity to conduct a concert called Keeping the Dream Alive. And that is because Kem gave his life, literally, to his community and African American youth. And I was pulled away from my undergraduate program, uh, to my senior year I graduated, but um, I was pulled away because he passed away in a car accident. He had a student who was driving his performance. Shouldn't feel that. But um, I, I was then called to come in and, and perform this concert for the community as an act of healing because of who Kim was and who he meant to me in my life. So um, I started violin. My mother gave me a violin at a very early age. I knew it was, uh, it was fun and it was interesting, but it, I knew it was something different because uh, kids would bully me. There was a kid who spit in my violin case at the bus stop. I still remember that. Um, there were kids in school who would laugh at me because I played the violin and uh, you know, give away my age. Call me Steve Urkel and some other things. <laughs> so, uh, I don't look like Steve Urkel. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Until my mother, she, I mean, she, she kept at it. She's like, you're gonna play this violin. She took me to my lessons, and uh, she took me to a concert at, at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. A beautiful stage they had there, and I saw these young black students with their curly curls in their hair, like they used to do. You know, they had tuxedos, but they, they sagged them a little bit, and they, uh, they just had a swag about them as they carried those string instruments on the stage. And Kem was the, was the music director of that event, and it was the most dynamic orchestral experience I'd ever had in my life. It was classical music, but it was done with certain 
energy that uh, black folks have when we perform. And uh, I knew I wanted to play the violin after that. And so uh, that's exactly what I did. I practiced more than I've ever practiced. And uh, Kim became my teacher and my mentor. And eventually I was able to be a member of the Cameron Youth Chamber Orchestra. And sadly, but not sadly, I became its director uh, for a number of years in the St. Louis area. So um, Kim Williams actually got his master's at the University of Massachusetts with my very small connection to Boston uh, before arriving here. And uh, he uh, you know, knew all the concerti. He knew all the sonatas. He's a phenomenal violinist, great, just a very charismatic educator and dedicated himself to providing opportunity for African-American youth. And I can say that we're all over the country. There are uh, grand students of Kim in major symphonies, and uh, the work is continuing in the St. Louis area in terms of youth orchestras uh, and community programs, and um, it, it inspires my work to this day. So, Kim Williams. Um, I'm not sure if I can point at a specific like one teacher, maybe out in like the community. So I grew up in the church. Whatever that Steve Harvey joke is, it's like deacons on Monday, <laughs> you know, deaconesses on Tuesday, kids on Wednesday. I, it felt like I was at church a lot. <laughs> so, um, and and because of that, you know, like I, I took up violin in like the fifth grade, and I couldn't sing at all. Um, they would go bless his heart, which is not a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, but they were like, well, you're going you're gonna to do something, right? And so I would have to get up there on Sundays, and I had to learn, you know, the material, the hymns, and everything. And that was kind of like my first interface with, with, with music, you know. Um, of course, yeah, I had the, you know, traditional canon and whatnot, but, you know, it was every Sunday was a chance to learn those hymns and everything. And then um, there was... Um, person there, Dorothy Miller, where she was always really influential in the sense of, like, I hear, I hear you, you know, Mozart's great, you know, have you heard the beginning of Total Praise? And I go, nah. She was like, yeah, you should check that out. And, you know, just slipping things every now and then, or have you really listened to the straight section of My Girl, you know, and all those things. And then that was just a coded way for me to learn those things, to play them on the church pageant show, something like that. So, um, I would say for me, that was like the, 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 the biggest kind of influence. You know, that was something down the line that's getting away from, you know, unfortunately, but that was something that was really significant to me and that was really um, impactful. And like a lot of things, you, know, you don't really understand what's kind of happening if you look back on it. Like, oh, yeah, that's, that's me, for sure. Alyssa, can you hear? Um, uh, it's been wonderful to watch people respond to the conversation and sometimes hear some words. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, so here's the, 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 the question. Uh, yes. Please highlight a teacher or other individual who was influential in shaping you as an Afrocentric music educator. Share aspects of their core beliefs, goals, approach to communal learning and or practices that influence you? Oh, this is fun. Um, okay, so um, I'm gonna preface this by saying that um, I was a Boston transplant, so I arrived in 2000 to teach at Boston Arts Academy. Um, before that, uh, I had returned uh, to my native Chicago area um, to pursue my um, master's degree in music education at uh, Northern Illinois University. It just so happened that two really important um, teachers and educators in my life uh, were there at the same time. So uh, my music ed master's degree, my focus was on jazz specifically, and that's when uh, Professor Ronald Carter was there. Uh, he was in his second year when I started, second or third year, um, and had just taken over as a coordinator of the Jazz Studies program uh, and was really committed to um, ensuring that the, uh, the heirs, the cultural heirs of jazz had a fair shot uh, in terms of getting into the school and staying there. 
Um, talk about a, you know, the shirt off your back kind of educator, uh, just as he was in St. Louis, uh, really created a, sp a safe space for black musicians going into the jazz program there because it was as, <laughs> as, as many, um, as are many uh, higher ed jazz programs decidedly un-Afrocentric. Uh, and so uh, he worked really hard, and, and part of that was deprogramming me as, um, as a, a vocalist in his band first, and then in the first year band, the second year. Um, and when I say that, I um, started piano lessons when I was five years old. Um, but I was raised, I think I've heard Sissel say something about being living in and with and being part of the community. Um, my family uh, was one that kind of left um, uh, to try to, you know, put us in whatever quote unquote better schools were. So I was raised in the suburbs, decidedly far from anything that resembled us and uh, and our culture, and the, certainly in the classroom, and definitely in music spaces. And uh, so when I got to grad school, by the time I had uh, landed there, um, I had never studied any music with anyone that looked like me, ever. Um, I started on the piano, was always in the choir, I was raised in the Lutheran church, so I didn't even have that there, right? Uh, and so when I say you program, really kind of recentering myself in who I who who I am culturally and always was and could never put my finger on. Why was I different in these spaces that I was growing up? Why was the way I was being taught and what I was being taught not enough for me? Right? Why did I feel like my head was being engaged and my certainly my aesthetic was being developed, but there was something missing. Whatever was happening to me, to me, very specific choice of words, whatever was happening to me in music spaces wasn't getting to the core of who I was at all. And I didn't understand why um, until I got to Northern Illinois University and Ronald Carter said, <laughs> Don't tap with your toe, tap with your heel, because your heel is closer to your hips. That was one of the many things. And I, I point that out because that is, that is now how I have my students keep time. If I see someone tapping their toe to keep time, in my, certainly, especially in my jazz vocal ensemble, I tell them to transfer that to their, to their heel. And it changes everything, right? Um, I don't have to tell my students to breathe because we move. If you move, you have to breathe. Uh, I'm a director of uh, vocal ensembles at University of South Florida. So my job is the singing uh, in groups <laughs> and the teaching of people to teach people to sing in groups. And so all of the modeling I do has something to do with percussion, has something to do with physical movement, uh, and, you know, kind of to capture it in a nutshell, we tap with our heel on our toe. Uh, there are maybe a few students in the entire school of music that study anything related to singing that look like me. Um, so I'm kind of back in the space where I grew up, but with a different mindset uh, and what I learned from Professor Carter was not to take any prisoners, not to pull any punches. So I lived in Florida, and I think it was, it's courage. It's courage that I learned to be exactly who you are, to seek that out, and to be that unashamedly, and to uh, really allow the experience that you're creating for and with your students to uh, capture that, to be centered in that. If everyone else is allowed to be exactly who they are, they are, then so am I. And if that means that I say things that might get me arrested in the state of Florida, then I'm going to do it. 
I tell them daily, put me in the blue suit. The orange doesn't look good on you. <laughs> I am going to jail because we're talking about this, right? Um, the other influential teacher that was there at the same time at NIU was Robert Sims, Baritone Robert Sims, who I, you know, I always was kind of assigned to sing the spirituals in the spaces that I grew up. Right? Oh, it's time for spirituals. Let's have Melissa Disa. Low hanging fruit, right? Um, it wasn't until Robert Sims that I re reconnected with that tradition. Um, and so those these two traditions now, jazz and spirituals, are the ones that I guard jealously and aggressively in spaces that um, either would typify or appropriate them. Uh, and from both of them, I guess I, I learned that courage to do that. Well, I don't know about you all, but that was just the first question. <laughs> I, I'm going to try a second question. Let's see. Um, this, this panel is, is just incredible. All right, so Sankofa Songs would like to offer some names of a few Bo of Boston Afrocentric music educators, past and present, uh, who've impacted our lives. Say the name so she can hear you. She can't see. Go for it. Oh, for Elizabeth. Yes. Speak up louder. Teach it. Say it louder. There we go. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, so, so what my very, very dear friend and, and fabulous colleague is, is uh, reminding me is something that we Afrocentric teachers do. We do what we need to do because we are determined to get the job done. And the only thing that stops us is putting us in a box. That's it. We don't stop. Sometimes it means we end up in boxes. But nevertheless, <laughs> we, we don't stop. So. Um, so, so the second question uh, is that we at Sankofa Songs would like to offer a few names of at Boston's Afrocentric music educators, past and present, some of whom are present today, uh, who've impacted our lives on a personal level. And so I'm, I'm speaking in terms of our board, uh, the, the names that we're going to give. That this, um, we're trying to figure out how, how we would bring this list into a manageable manner. And, and it still wasn't entirely manageable, but we said, who are the folks that really impacted us personally? And, and of course, there are, are so, so many. And these are just the Boston folk, by the way. We're just talking about the Boston folk. Um, some of these pedagogues are even in the room today. Panelists, please interrupt me and, and add your comments and reflections um, on these great teachers. So. I have to start off with Roland Hayes, right? The great tenor and teacher living and working in Boston a little more than a century ago. And then of course I must mention his daughter who's sitting right over here, who's also been teaching music in Boston for a long time. I'm now retired and 90 years old. <laughs> One's a musician, one's a dancer. So, so that legacy is, is a very strong one. It's very exciting, that family. Uh, Florence Price and William Grant Still, um, both were New England Conservatory students, and, well, I'm going to assume that everyone in the room is familiar with those names and the extraordinary work they've done in their lives. They are not with us anymore. Uh, Coretta Scott, who was later Coretta Scott King, right, who studied music education at NEC. And you guys interrupt me. Well, I would, I would say that um, one of my mentors' main, uh, I mentioned that he knew the concerto, he knew the sonata, but he also introduced us to the work of William Grant Still and the work of Florence Price. And so that's part of the work that we do at Afro, at I'll also add two with, with those two around the uh, family connection. 
So the first instance where you see model like this often from your parents. So one's price point or more parents she taught. Uh, anyway, the, there's this direct lineage of uh, familiar modeling for sure. Yeah, thank you, which we, we've seen on the panel. Interrupt me, interrupt me, please. <laughs> um, let's see here. George Walker, all the string players in here are going to just, we're just gonna go crazy about George Walker, right? Ann Hobson Pilot and her husband, Prentice Pilot, right? Uh, harpist in Boston Symphony and uh, fir first African American in Boston Symphony, principal harpist for what seemed like forever. Uh, she sure touched my life and, and then, of course, she and her husband um, were really influential in the early days of Project Step, and maybe you'll interrupt me a little more on that. Uh, Elma Lewis and her School of Performing Arts, as well as her National Center for Afro-American Artists and the Museum of the National Center for Afro-American for Afro Artists. And one Betty Hillman, who we'll get back to in just a moment, who's, who's very instrumental at the National Center. Uh, T.J. Anderson and Ollie Wilson. Anybody want to add their two cents on T.J. and Ollie? Uh, extraordinary music teachers. They taught at Miss Lewis's school. Uh, they taught at Tufts University. They taught me. Uh, and and um, T.J. Anderson is still with us. Uh, I remember uh, first thing that jumps to my mind, which is not the most significant thing he's done, but what just jumped to my mind is his orchestrating of Scott Joplin's Trimonesia. He's done so much. Um, Ollie Wilson as well. Let's see, William Thomas, who is a cellist mm -hmm. uh, and a project step pedagogue and music director at Cambridge uh, Community Chorus. And let's see, and geez, he did a lot of stuff. Uh, Leonard Brown, who taught at Boston, uh, Northeastern University in Boston for, seems like forever, right? Huge champion of the music of John Coltrane. Uh, Robert Honeysucker, yes. Yes. Uh, right, right, uh, amazing voice, um, taught all of us at one time or another somehow. Ruth Hamilton, Ruth Hamilton, uh, really, really extraordinary uh, alto and fine teacher in the Boston mm -hmm. schools and uh, all around. Elton Garrett, is, is Miss Garrett here? I know she was trying to come, but I, I wasn't sure she Another uh, brilliant teacher, and both uh, uh, Ruth Hamilton and Elta Garrett are, uh, Elta Garrett is still with us, Ruth Hamilton isn't, but they're, of course, uh, the namesake for the Hamilton Garrett Music School in Dorchester. <coughs> Debbie Hellman, cellist and African-American folk song specialist for members of the Kodai community, right here. Really, really brilliant um, work also with Elma Lewis that, that, that Betty's done and just a huge impact on me. Robert Winfrey, uh, also vocalist, pedagogue at Harvard University, Boston Public Schools, and I mentioned that Regan Hayes Lamb. Uh, so, so before we go, oh. Can I just add one? Please, please. So Cutie Jones. Oh my gosh. Oh, yes. How did I land him on He's um, in Blaze. His name is um, in Blaze in the Freedom Plaza along with his mm -hmm. work. But he started Boston Children's Choir, which he has affected thousands of And he's still alive and well. Yes, he is. He's in the Yes, in the yeah. He's still here. <laughs> yeah, huge impact in, in the. Arts and culture. Uh, actually, we, I was supposed to open it up to the community. <laughs> did, did, were there some other additions? Marcus Thompson. Oh, oh my gosh. My old stand partner. How, right. How did Marcus Thompson get? So, like I said, we, you know, this, this list is a couple pages long, and, and that's a short one, the short version. Um, so, so this way of teaching which is a little bit not quite the same as the way we're all taught in music ed schools. It's similar, but not the same. Um, is, is not a new uh, impact in Boston, and not a new impact across the nation um, and the world. 
And in, in your programs, there's a, a little um, a description of, of uh, Sankofa Song's approach, our, our, our attempt at codifying this paradigm, this man, mindset in, into a framework. Yeah, I just wanted to add Owen Young. Oh, Owen Young, who's very much alive and well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, so, yeah, and, and we were we were fellows at Tanglewood together. Yeah, that's right. A huge model for you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just saying. Oftentimes, I mean, in a lot of my work, it's always important to name what you're solving for. Um, because oftentimes people will be like, something is wrong, this is something, let's do that. But they don't actually know what the problem is. They just want to do something in order to feel like they're doing something. Uh, because they haven't actually done the real work of naming what it is they're solving for. Uh, and so I think that's super common. Um, especially in PWI in particular, for those who don't know, it's predominantly white institutions, it's oftentimes there's an awareness that something is wrong in there. It's like, uh, but I don't know what to do, so let's just start doing stuff and, and end up actually causing more harm by their by doing because you didn't actually know what you were solving for. And so now you create, where there was one problem, your, your doing of something has created 10 other problems, uh, 10 new problems. And so I'm just curious, um, you know, on your end, what's your thought on what's the difference? So I'm so glad. Oh, so you can sit there. Oh, I, I thought no. you were going to answer the question. Oh, no, man. <laughs> no, we need you to sit in that chair. So Janethea Hopes is one of our uh, board members. That's why I thought she might. And an amazing singer. Um, oh, definitely. Didn't you tell me that one. You might want to move on the other side. This is still may not be able to hear. Yeah. Alyssa, can you hear? Mm -hmm. That was a no? No. No, not, not really. I can, I can oh. hear some things. Oh. But that's okay. Thank you. I've been important things and, and lots of great reactions. So. I did hear Janikia's name being dropped. <laughs> Hi, Alyssa. There you go. <laughs> All right, now I'm probably blocking them. We'll manage. All right, so, so I did speak a little bit to this, but your question it's is central. Is. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's like, it's what a, is the thing you're solving right. for? Rather it's, than what the methodology itself, what is the thing that that methodology solves? Right. What's the problem that you solve? So, this is dangerous. Let's go. When we are friends here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Keep, keep, me, keep it moving. This my soapbox in like 30 seconds. To me, the whole point of bringing these people together is actually to have a conversation and to solve for some things. And it's so important, I think, that we have the courage to do that as often as possible. Because in my opinion, we are, uh, sometimes our hesitation to be honest and candid is part of the problem, right? Because they're, and, and you know, and, and you know, we, so we didn't want to say white people. I'm like, why not? Like, they're, they're white. they know they're white. Thank why you. can't we say that? You know Thank what I mean? you. And so like, it's, and the thing is, they're not really good white people that we don't tell the truth to them. Right, and so the good, even the even good white people don't have an opportunity to be able to do the real work because we hold keep answers from them because we're nervous about the ones that are whack. And I'm like, hey, why don't we talk to the people? Why don't we assume that everybody, if everybody's about this life, and actually tell them the things that that is the actual truth? And if they end up being whack, cool. Now we know. But I think I, I think it's so important for us to name the problem in this educational system that's really why you brought us here. I think it's so important to name what the problem is that we're solving for because we may not have the answers, but the answers may be in the room if we're all aligned on what the thing is we're solving for. 
And so I just, you know, I, I, I would, I wouldn't, I'm, not, I'm not trying to come in, I'm always coming hot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but I think it, but to me, it's, I think that the future is so much mm -hmm. going to be rooted in us actually being able to name what the problem is, not trying to find what the solution is. Right. My greatest mentor told me, if you ever want to control the room, control the question. Because the person who controls the question controls the thing that everybody's solving for. You don't have to control the product, you control the question. And so for us, I think it's so important to be, be very thoughtful and be very honest and candid about what is the thing that we're solving for and why do we need to have Afrocentric education in the first place? Right, the reason we have to have it is because the traditional white-centered, white-framed, Eurocentric thing doesn't speak to us. We can't be great in that system. So we had to create another way in which our identity allowed us to be, a, was a sense of power and strength. Like that is what I feel like you and I talked about. And I think that it's important for us as, um, um, as, as experts in our field, as the one that we're, all the people we name, we are those people for other people now, right? And so it's important for us from that platform to be able to candidly say, yeah, that stuff is problematic. It's not that it's just not good, it's hurtful. It's harmful, it's damaging. And so we want to stop hurting people with our educational practices. So to me, I think that is what I, I wanted to say, and that was for 90 seconds. But, um, but I just wanted to, and, but I think from your end, I'd love to hear from you because you're the one who brought us here. You're the one who had foresight to be able to bring us all here. So I'm curious from your perspective, what is the thing that we're solving for? So when I said that's dangerous, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I I was not noting the obvious. I was noting the fact that he asked an educator who has very strong feelings about a whole bunch of stuff and had more than half a century to think about them. He asked her an open question. <laughs> so, and, and this room does have a time limit. So, <laughs> there is somebody else in, in this room at some point in time. So I promise I will not hog the stage up. I've been trying not to do that. I don't know if I succeed, but I was trying. Uh, so this idea of Afrocentric is, is to put in the discussions concerning Africa-descended people, to put the Africa-descended people in the center. Sounds simple. Not what usually happens. And, and to have whatever is that element, let it speak for itself on its terms. So if you're asking me, Ask me, don't say she said, right? If, if you're talking about the Korah, don't contextualize it as a lute. Lutes came along a few thousand years after the Korah. Why are you gonna make the Korah a lute? The lute is a Korah, not the other way around, right? Uh, so, so that's the first element. The second element is around this topic of emancipation. So, Often folks think of this word Afrocentric and immediately they say, oh, this is an opposite in, in opposition to our traditional ways of teaching the Eurocentric model. And that's the crazy thing. Afrocentric is not in opposition to anybody or anything. It just says when you when you talk about us and our stuff, let us talk about us and our stuff. And likewise, if if you can let us talk about ourselves and our stuff, then that means when you go to some other part of the world, you might be able to let them talk about themselves and their stuff. And you might even look in the mirror, as Michael Jackson said, and, and look at your own self and your own stuff. Now, will this bring up all kinds of stuff? Yes. It's gonna happen. But we highly melanated people, we're, we're really used to stuff coming out, <laughs> like daily, like hourly, sometimes minutely, if that's a word. So, so, but the way our society is arranged is such that if you're not highly melanated, maybe your stuff doesn't always smack you in the face or, or someone doesn't smack you in the face with their stuff, like all the time. And so maybe that, that's kind of jarring and new. To us, we're like, okay, and? So, so 
So I'm not in any way attempting to be confrontational, but I'm really, really interested in, in this topic of freedom, of emancipation. Because in, in knowing Sankofa, as I said in, in the opening, means it is not wrong to go back and take that which is yours, right? When, when you know what is yours, uh, all of this is very much a personal mission um, for me as well as I think all of us. We want to know what's ours. And, and when, when we can really deeply understand the stuff that was put in us in those pallet greens on Sunday night, right? And fried chicken. Yeah, from the vegan. Right? <laughs> Don't worry, I haven't had that fried chicken in a long time. But I do, when I smell them, I'm like, mm. <laughs> It's still good, I must say. Remember it should be fast. You know? Yeah. Uh, th that which was truly in, in, our, in our blood, in our veins, that, that was instilled in us when we didn't even know it was being put in, in, in our communities. And even Alyssa, the, those of us who, Alyssa and I, both grew up very far away from the community. And it wasn't until I was well into my 30s that, that I began to figure out how to be black, which sounds humorous. And many people, whenever I say that, and, and during the time, that, that moment that I was trying, they, they would just laugh and quite literally fall off their chair. They're like, what do you mean trying to figure out how to be black? Well, when you grow up in a place where there's no black people, and the only black people you see or on the 11 o'clock news with those stripes and the bars and all that, mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's hard to get a really clear sense of self, right? Um, but I digress. Um, there, there's some stuff that's put in us, in, as, as uh, Dr. Adley says so eloquently, in a, a communal place. And then there's some stuff that when we study, we start to find, oh, that's mine, that's mine, and that works, right? When, when we spend some time in some archives or, or when I spend some time with Elma Lewis's work, and we start putting it all together and then we get some kind of magic and we discover this works full stop. However, there are some assumptions that must, must be acknowledged. So, so as, uh, thank you so much for, for bringing the, the question. Um, I went on my way to absolutely positively never be a music teacher. That failed. Um, I've, I've been in a classroom since 1992, so you can tell how well I succeeded at that one. However, um, because my route was in the way of performance, I didn't take all those education courses until much later when I was working on my doctorate, well, and also getting certified. Um, but the, the way that African descended people teach, there's a couple of big categories, and there's three of them listed in, in your program. Um, the first is, is around community, although it's worded in terms of individuals. And that is, the student can learn, and the student can learn from me. No, so to this day, I've never met a, a teacher of any sort, a music teacher or otherwise, who doesn't at least say, all students can learn. But Afrocentric, Africa-descended teachers who really teach from this paradigm genuinely are unaware that, that there's a possibility that a student would not be able to learn and learn from them. Like, they, they walk in the room, it's taken for granted, everybody's gonna learn. It's not, not nice words that we put on a sign or something. That, that's, that's in our bones. Every student can learn, every student will learn, and every student's gonna learn from me. The details of what they will learn and how they will learn, we work that out along the way. Um, the second is that the teacher can and must grow. I don't know any teachers that won't say, oh yes, we go to professional development. That's not what we're talking about. <laughs> that, that's the, it's, it's, it's like in our blood, that these are core beliefs that this must happen. And these things must happen not for the individual, but because the group must be successful. And for the group to be successful, the individual must be successful. And for the individual to be successful, the group must be successful. All right, so that's your first um, sort of category. Uh, we have a, a bunch of core beliefs around the topic of our relationship with 
art and culture in this place. When I say this place, I'm referring to the Americas. I, I, I use the word America, but quite frankly, it's, it's all of the Americas. Because right. none of us raised our hand and said, ooh, ooh, please put me in some chains and drag me across the ocean. Nobody mm -hmm. raised their hand and asked for that. <laughs> but nevertheless, once we got here, this place has never been the same. <laughs> for better or for worse, we've just had this incredible impact. And so we have a bunch of core beliefs around the value of our, our, our culture and how central it is to this place. And then the third category that's in, in your program, and there's many, many more. This is far from exhaustive. And each individual has their own enforcement. But of the ones that we at San Songs have been able to really codify, this, this third category has to do with us to ourselves. That is our belief in our own self-worth. Our, our belief in, in our own self-definition. And I think my colleagues have spoken to that today, I think. Uh, I'd like to open this up now for some questions. I know you guys have some questions for folks, and, and I hope I began to get to a, a little bit of the why. Uh, can I add to what the Yeah, was please. Doing? Okay, so um, uh, I'm, I'm a member of the artistic advisor of um, projects that um, and she works with and um, Sonia. Um, and but I grew up knowing Sonia. Um, uh, my since I was nine, we were almost be real. Um, and I grew up in a community of musicians that looked like me, but I saw them very rarely. I would say that like they. We grew up together. Um, I saw them first at BU, and then we moved over to NBC. It was like a mass exodus, and then, <laughs> and then, um, and then, like I never saw anybody because I was part of NBC Prep, and then I was part of NBC Chamber Ensemble, and so like there are pictures and archives of like when we would have master classes. Um, one picture, Joy, that you put up here. Um, uh, um, with uh, Sadie and Russell Bovich and like amazing musicians that would come through um, the doors um, of Tiffany Hall and that's when we would see each other and gather and be together. But there wasn't really time to like communally be, like I don't remember, bar like we didn't have a barbecue, we didn't do that. We didn't have, we just performed together or played together or played with different people. Um, as representatives, but we didn't really play play together. Um, and I say that um, kind of prefacing the story of like of um, our last Martin Luther King performance um, uh, at the um, Crop Center um, from Project Step, where I heard the song called Testimony, and I immediately went um, to Dr. Saunders. Um, and I said, like, where's the music? <laughs> and I was like, I need, I need this music because I want to teach it to my students. Um, and um, I proceeded to get the music and then proceeded to teach it to my students. And I was asking them, like, I feel a very strong responsibility because I teach students that look like me. Um, and that was not my experience growing up. Okay, um, and I see, like, I yes, I went to Walnut Hill School, but I also had there was one other person who looked like me in my class. Um, That's one more than me. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's right. But I mean, that, I mean, and she came in my my senior year, so that was like that, that was that was all we that, that was all we had. And I remember having a conversation um, because I went to play um, Beethoven Ghost with Joy and Troy. Um, and um, Amani Hamu, he was Amani Hamu then. Yeah. Amani is his way. Right, okay, right. And there was a conversation about Beethoven being black, talking about uncomfortable conversations. And um, I said, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> what 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 are you talking about? Um, and it blew my mind 
And I came back to school um, and walked in the door and um, said, so I just heard this crazy, like this thing that based on women's black and the teacher literally flipped around, like turned his entire body from me and like was like anyway and proceeded to teach the class. And I didn't like, I, I just thought, okay, well, I guess I was wrong and that's not possible. And I continued to walk past the Benjamin statue that was white in NEC, which I won't go past anymore. Um, um, I would literally go around the whole other way and just not um, pass that statue. And um, uh, like, it just was such a transformative point for many people that I knew that I didn't even recognize happened. Um, and I say that I'm trying to but I say that to say that I recognize for the students that I teach that I am the person that um, holds a lot of information in my blood. And sometimes I, my mouth drops and I'm like, you don't know who Ella Fitzgerald was. You don't know who, you, you, you know, like I, I have to stutter <laughs> at that point because I actually can't believe that they don't know because I grew up knowing and I have to say to myself in those times I hold this gate like I hold this key and I have to let them know I am responsible of letting them know that the music that they play is the story and they are now like holders of the story so when we when when I taught the story of testimonial when I taught the piece um, I was asking them what does this sound like to you what does this part sound like to you? What does this portion of the music sound like? Because it is a story, like the testimony that we have, I know many people understand the word testimony is like what happens in church, and like you know, the, the person who comes up and talks about all God has put them through or what, what he has seen them through. And I started from that lens, but then I, I asked them to bring it back from 400 years ago and they didn't, they, they created the concept of the story. And that is what created the power of the story. So when they now play the piece, and I remind them to tell the story, every time they play and put the bow on the instrument, whatever, whichever instrument it is, it has power. And that for me is like the reason why we do this as educators is to tell the story and to not silence the voices anymore because that is our responsibility. Sorry. those who taught me. I had great teachers. I studied with, my goodness, I, when I look back, if, if, if you're trying to get a pedigree for a brilliant, extraordinary teacher, I studied with all the greats, truly all the greats, internationally, nationally, like I spent a lot of time traveling, right? But I wasn't in the picture. And if I wasn't in the picture, there are a whole bunch of other people who also weren't in the picture. And when I found myself in a classroom, and I honestly don't know how it happened, I call it divine intervention because it was not my idea. I, I discovered that I had to find a way to teach where I was in the room too, because I was physically in the room. How am I gonna teach and leave myself out of the room, right? And, and how am I gonna say to the students, I am nothing? What, what, what's my testimony, right? Um, and, and that was part of my path, a huge part of my path that got me on, on um, which was going to be question number three about <laughs> the question about this uh, um, continuum of, of uh, Afrocentric perspective in our teaching. Ms. Uh, Hodges. Um, I have to run back to my notes because 
you all have my mind going, oh, just right. that's okay. Oh. Um, and I'll try to project Alyssa. If you can't hear me, please let me know, but I'll try to use my singer teacher voice. Come over here. So, um, I wanted to start by, oh no. <laughs> I guess it was for me too. <laughs> um, I wanted to start, so getting back to your question of what is the issue we're trying to solve, um, but from this idea of deprogramming. And something that I feel like a lot of us have touched on but not used these words yet is the internalization of a colonized mindset. And so any of us who have gained any level of proficiency in the Eurocentric music education performance paradigm, we have internalized, because this is all that we've been taught, and a colonized mindset that says everything our people bring to the picture is inferior. And so part of, I think, the problem that we're trying to solve, and I've been reading Goldie Muhammad's Cultivating Genius, I'm on my way to unearthing joy, and she talks about this historically responsive literacy framework. And she looks back to the black literacy societies of the 1800s, and she talks about the fact that the first and core pursuit of those organizations was the formation of identity. And that we, as a people, use literacy, music, arts, anything, first and foremost, to develop a healthy and positive sense of who we are. The colonized mindset does not provide that. In fact, it provides the exact opposite. And so by bringing in more than just that Eurocentric arts education framework, we allow for a development of identity for all people Right? Because again, as Sonia said, it's not excluding the Eurocentric, it's adding on to it. We are here in the Americas, where there's lots of different cultures. And if we allow space for all of them equally, then we allow space for the development of all identities in a healthy and positive way equally. And I think that's really part of what we at Sankofa Songs are trying to address. Um, I could get into my own story, but I won't bother because it mirrors in many ways a lot of what has already been shared here. But I think, you know, I just really felt the need to share that. So thank you all. And I hope you could hear me, Alyssa. <laughs>
the black area where we had no sidewalks. And that was one, one part of me, and I did all of my life there. I was an excellent student. There were nine kids in our family, so we all had stuff to do. The other part of it was, I was a cellist. I played a cello that no one else wanted in the uh, school, so I, every year, from grade four all the way up, I played cello. And the, the school that I attended was basically white kids. Uh, and I lived in the black neighborhood. So I had both cultures going at the same time. And it never dawned on me that I was supposed to not have that. Uh, I, I was uh, doing it, you know, that's what you did. But I guess one of my questions is uh, sort of, I don't know how to do it, but that we, we have black neighbor, we have black culture, and trying to get into, uh, I don't know, into the white culture. I, there's something missing here, and I don't particularly want to do that, uh, get into the white culture. Uh, but I don't know how, how to explain that, because I live in both, and I have to do both. So I don't know, it's, it's a question that we get started at when we, and I can't find the answer right now, but there's something in it. Yeah. So, kind of tagging on to the things that I think um, we touch on, but sometimes we miss. Um, the longer you say, this is something I tell my students all the time, when you're, when you're an educator, the thing that will change in the classroom Generally, the students are going to be the same age for your entire career. You're the person that's getting cancer. Um, and <laughs> it's true. So, <laughs> the, the, I stayed some I don't know about that. I hear you. I hear you. Um, the, the thing I think that we have to look at, you know, we don't come as a monolith. And I'm going to pull on something that Alyssa touched on growing up Lutheran is that even within our own community and how many of us were taught <clears throat> within that experience of being central, a lot of it will depend on what's, how that community um, embraced arts education. And I'll, you know, so for my own upbringing in the Black Presbyterian Church where many of the people were Johnson C. Smith near graduates, and my mother in a black Baptist church, so the music traditions were, were different, but yet still part of the same community. So you take from what people are learning and how some of our students learn, and then coming into that box of how people have been traditionally taught, <clears throat> it's the responsibility of the educator to get into that mind and say, okay, if I'm trying to teach Ear, ear training is part of that traditional canon, but that's not necessarily the way ear training was taught because how certain communities have taught music. Then we have to take what they've already learned and figure out how do you transfer that to this um, environment so that they can be successful. So the, the issue is I think some teachers stop because they have no uh, idea of how to reach that student or they give up too soon. And um, the, the, the key that you have to get them to, to use is that within a family, not that every family is perfect, but you have a tendency not to give up on those who are struggling. And even if you have to pull that person and put them right beside you, you're dragging them along with you until they get it. And we can probably all point to certain students in our own career that we've had to you know, pull them along and put them beside you to say, I know you can get it. You might not understand it now, but here are the things I will do as an educator to break it down so that you can grasp this information. Uh, we can rebuild your foundation uh, to make it better. I think sometimes um, <clears throat> the thing that we are afraid to do is look at how we fix the past. 
living in a community like Boston. Most of us, this is the Northeast, don't have the luxury to, to come into the community and buy a brand new home. We purchase the home as it is, and we look at it long term to figure out how do we fix it to make it into what we want. And that's the same thing you have to do with your kids that are in front of you. There are certain issues that they bring to the table, like that older home that you purchased, and we figure out how do you fix the foundation to make it stable? How do you add on the dorm room to give yourself more space? And I think this is what we sometimes miss in that educational environment when we see the kid that comes into the classroom that might not look like us, and we think that the, the, the equipment is broken, but it just might need the attention for the renovation that we would still give to the home that we're invested in to create more value, and we can do the same thing with that space. So, um, I have two sons, they're migration. Uh, my ex-wife is sweet. Uh, and so my, my two boys, they have to understand multiple parts of their identities. But well, that's very common now, you know, biracial children, so it's not like this is like, oh, that's odd, you know. Um, but there are these multiple um, components of their identity that I have been as their father watching them find some balance in. Um, and them not trying to say, well, this is the part of me that's black, and this is the part of me that's Swedish, but like, but this is all of me, right? So the, these are the component, these are the things that make up Henning Washington or Mateus Washington, my boys, right? Like that is, and I think that what happens is when we, when we sever them, because we may be of a single identity, what we're doing is we're buying into that kind of Tucker Carlson, replacement theory idea that if there's more of you there must be less of me and right uh, and so the zero sum game what's that the zero, zero, zero sum game. game right whereas when you're when you're thinking about it from a from a liberatory perspective liberation doesn't work like that right you know they you know there you know, there's um, you know people talk about racism racism is, racism is bad for white people too you like if you're a white person who exists in a racist system you have you don't have the opportunity to engage in anything from a moral authority, right? Because it's like actually you're engaging and benefiting from this system that is clearly oppressive. And so it's bad for you, that system is bad for you to go to church as much as you want, right? As long as you're benefiting from that system, then there is, there, there's, some, there's dirt on you, right? And so when you, so if you think about it from a liberatory perspective, the idea isn't to try to, the idea is to try to be like, how do I get more of this and less of that? How do I, you know, have you know more black people, you know, and fewer white people, and like to me, that is that's that's actually the the wrong frame for it. The question is, how do we find ways to equitably celebrate all the different pieces of all the identities that are around us? And every time a new identity shows up, we use that's an opportunity for us to celebrate a new one, right? It's not oh god, we gotta take this holiday now. Oh, now we gotta celebrate this, you know, right? It's like, it's, to me, if you think about it from a liberatory perspective, all of those things are beautiful opportunities to grow as a human, right? And so it's not that, you know, when I'm with my sons, I'm like, okay, well, you're with me now, you're not with your mom, so you gotta be super black this week, you know, because you're with dad, you know, and then with your mom, you can be super Swedish, you know, and then you can figure it out between you, but I think that for, for, for me, from my own philosophy around that, it is, trying to legitimately find ways to, um, to amplify and celebrate the various cultures, identities, perspectives that are around and, and in a way that it shows myself that I truly value. So if I, you know, if you know, Black History Month, right, I'm black all 12 months, right? right? I'm not only black in February, Right, and so if you're thinking about things from a Black History Month perspective, you're like, oh, we're gonna really care about black people in February and forget them the other 11, right? Like that, that doesn't mean anything. And so to me, the, the, um, the real goal at the end is to try to find and create and, and have some humility to be able to say that every time we have an opportunity to celebrate another culture, then we're winning. And also looking at ourselves to say, is there a culture that we said that I celebrate more than any other, 
right? And, and, and if that's the case, and for me, for the CEO, the person in a position of power, I've got to be cognizant of my identity and how it shows up, because I have power, I can control what we do from an institutional perspective. And so when you're in a position of power, whether it's from position or cultural power, you have to be aware of how that power shows up and how it manifests itself as well in your space, because really what you want to do is create these spaces that allow for the amplification of as many voices and perspectives as possible, and not worrying yourself too much around, am I drowning out another one? Because if you are and they speak up, it's an opportunity for you to celebrate them even more. And so to me, from that space of like compassion, uh, you know, that beautiful space of compassion and humility, to me, that's the, that, that feels like the real end goal is to be able to be there. So if someone says, hey, you know, um, you have not, you don't really celebrate Jewish holidays, and I watch you celebrate others, oh my gosh, let's have a conversation about how we can be better at doing that as an institution. Right, like to me, that's the goal, because there is no destination. You know, li you know, liberation is a thing that we strive for, but there's no destination that we're like, oh, we made it. Right, uh, you know, it's, it, 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 is, it is a generational, long, uh, aspirational concept. So as long as we're all engaging in that, from an aggressive perspective in each generation, then we will get closer to it. So I hope that responds a little bit. Oh, yeah. Yes, please. So, so good to see you. Um, uh, tell your say to all the people. Um, my name is Betsy Winkle. Um, I'm the founder of the Boston Public Quartet and Music Connects, and um, actually developing the curriculum currently. Um, and the first scale that I put in there was the pentatonic scale, because um, I mean I'm also like a very a kind of person who wants to distill it down to just like. The, the easy kernel because I also work with little ones. Like that's sort of where I'm always starting from. And the fact that the pentatonic scale to me seems like magic that it was developed simultaneously by so many different cultures and it didn't like start somewhere and spread somewhere else. So there is no like first person who came up with the pentatonic scale, but it is in every single music that we know about, but you know, Native American, African, Asian, etc. And so, you know, that's just like one, one, uh, one instance of where it's not sort of like, oh, the pentatonic scale is this. No, it's everything. It's every one. It started with, it, like, the diatonic scale is actually the, 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 the one that we used to think was like the, the normal one, <laughs> you know, is, is made from the pentatonic. Anyway, just something simple as that. And, like when I have students who are, who are black, like I play it and they're like, oh, that's, my grandma says that's the gospel scale. I'm like, you're right, that's the, you know, it's like, and if someone says, that sounds like Chinese music, you're right. <laughs> you know, it's just like, it's like, so anyway, just one, one way of instead of like, I know you said you didn't, it's hard for you to embrace white culture. Why do you need to do that? And the other thing I would say is that I firmly believe that there is no white culture or maybe even human culture without black culture. Like we're even finding out that uh, mm -hmm. first written language was actually from Africa. That's right. You know things like that. So I think like we, we all have to. It's okay to just not even. You don't have to separate the different cultures. Um, and and you bring what you bring, and it is an it's a, it's an original one. You know it's the, the very first. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I I'm overwhelmed. Um, I'm just overwhelmed, and and uh, I'll I'll leave it at that, and maybe I'll just put myself back in my little chair and and just watch. Um, but I, I'm so grateful. I, I'm so grateful to be in the presence of this panel. I'm so grateful to be in the presence of all of you, um, and of course all of our ancestors. They they speak to me also. Um, so I'm just going to go over there now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, and we have an exit um, survey. Um, so thank you. Uh, thank you for some board members having an exit survey. And we're always trying to create